Marxism in its relation to science is extraordinarily dense and dramatic. From the beginning, Marxism took science extremely seriously, not only for its economic promise in building a socialist society, for its revelatory power in understanding the world. Marxism has made the strongest claims of any intellectual tradition before or since about the socio-historical character of science, yet always affirmed its cognitive achievements. Never saw these in contradiction with each other, unlike most other traditions in philosophy of science. This is its distinctiveness. Science was seen as inextricably enmeshed with economic systems, technological developments, political movements, philosophical theories, cultural trends, ethical norms, ideological positions, indeed, with all that was human. It was also a path of access to the natural world. There were studies, texts, theories, tensions, debates, exploring the complexities of how this was so. The internalist, externalist dualism could never do justice to this interacting field of forces. Marxism has combined attention to the advancing results of the empirical sciences, development of a philosophical framework capable of integrating expanding knowledge, and awareness of the socio-historical context of it all. That is the distinctiveness of Marxism, the fact that it, it integrates it synthesizes all of these dimensions in the one tradition. After the October Revolution, there was an intensification of this activity. Science was a necessity in building a new social order. Scientific theory was thought to be not only a matter of truth and error, but of life and death. There were many debates, some between those more grounded in the empirical sciences, and others who stress the continuity of Marxism with the history of philosophy. Intertwined with all these intellectual debates of the day was an intense struggle for power. There was tension between a more cosmopolitan Marxist intelligentsia who found their way to Marxism in difficult and dangerous conditions. They were exposed to an array of intellectual influences. They were accustomed to mixing with intellectuals of many points of view and arguing the case for Marxism in such milieu. Increasingly, they were coming under pressure from those who had come up under the revolution, who had never been abroad, who knew no foreign languages, had little detailed knowledge either of the natural sciences or of the history of philosophy never mixed with the exponents of other intellectual traditions. Some were more inclined to cite the authority of classical texts or party degrees, decrees to engage in theoretical debate. They were being fast-tracked in their careers and taken over as professors, directors of institutes, members of editorial boards, and occupying positions of authority over intellectuals of international reputation. There was high drama and there was soon to be blood on the floor. It was the more cosmopolitan intelligentsia that came to London in 1931. The Second International History of Science Congress spilled over into the mass media with the arrival of a Soviet delegation led by Nikolai Bukharin and including Boris Hessian, Nikolai Vovilov, and others renowned in the history of science. They were struggling for their version of Marxism against one set of pressures at home and quite another set of pressures abroad. They navigated these turbulent waters impressively. Nevertheless, tragedy engulfed them. The 1931 Congress brought forces already in motion into a new level of interaction with each other. At this Congress, conflicting worldviews were in collision. Those most touched by this confrontation were those who stood in between, not on a via media, not in a space of ideological neutrality, but on terrain where they lived and worked among those 
skeptical or hostile to their position, while sharing a vision with those who came from afar. Nevertheless, there was an upsurge of the left through the 1930s, and the wind was at their backs. The ideas of J.D. Bernal, J.B.S. Haldane, Joseph Needham, and other leading scientists who became Marxists took hold among many of their contemporaries. Some of those who were fired up by these ideas perished as a direct result. The encounter between British and Soviet Marxists radiated outward and touched many who did not attend the Congress. The book, Science the Crossroads, was translated into many languages and it's found its way into many parts of the world for many decades now. It was read by Antonio Gramsci in his prison cell. Significantly, it came into the hands of Christopher Codwell as he raced through every field of human knowledge, conceptualizing everything from a Marxist point of view. From this came amazing tracks on biology and physics, as well as history, philosophy, psychology, culture, and much more, <coughs> all left unfinished when he was struck down in the Spanish Civil War. David Guest, before he too died in Spain, took the text of the crisis in physics to Hyman Levy, who edited and introduced it, and J.B.S. Haldane reviewed it. After 1945, the influence of Marxism spread ever wider. In Eastern Europe, Marxism became the dominant force in universities, research institutes, academic journals of the new socialist states. Its influence intensified in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, especially in liberation movements, some of which became parties of power. Marxism was sometimes a matter of deepest conviction, but sometimes not. Being an orthodoxy in a one-party state was not a recipe for healthy development of an intellectual tradition. We have passed the time in history now where it seems possible or desirable to organize a society on the basis of a common world view. But it did not seem that way for most of the history of the world. Up until the 1960s, the Catholic Church exercised that kind of power in Ireland and elsewhere. Nevertheless, there was serious work done in developing a distinctive approach to science studies particularly in exploring the philosophical implications of the natural sciences. This was the case in the academies of Eastern Europe, particularly in the German Democratic Republic, in the intellectual life of communist parties, in journals such as Science and Society and Modern Quarterly. It was very different from the narrowly methodological approach being pursued in philosophy of science elsewhere. It was a work of profound significance that was too little known in the rest of the world. In the, 19, the 1960s and 1970s put Marxism on the agenda in a new way. This was a time when all that had been assumed was open to question, when the universities and the streets became contested terrain. Academic disciplines were scrutinized at their very foundations. Philosophy, sociology, literature, science, indeed all knowledge, was seen as tied to power. University campuses and academic conferences were alive with passion and polemic. Journals such as Radical Philosophy, Insurgent Sociologist, Science for the People gave expression to this ferment. Many of my generation threw ourselves wholeheartedly into this searching and this striving. There was residual anti-communism as well as generation, generational rebellion in the US New Left's attitude to the old left. There was also a naivete about power, obliviousness of economics, and suspicion of science. I shared these attitudes at first. I changed when I moved to Europe when the gap between the new left and the old left was not so large. My involvement in the political culture of Europe was transforming, and I took a new look at the previous generation of the left. 
Indeed, at that time, many were still alive, although most of those who touched me most deeply were dead by then. Nevertheless, they came alive in my imagination as I read their texts and grilled their contemporaries about their lives. Burnell and Caldwell especially were my mentors. I became interested in Marxism as a comprehensive worldview. I was intrigued by the ways in which intellectual movements were rooted in socio-historical forces. I saw the whole history of philosophy that I had been studying in a new way. I saw everything in a new way, a way in which everything was interconnected. Philosophy, culture, politics, economics, science. I decided to focus on science within this network of relationships, oddly, because it was what I felt I most needed to understand. Not what it, it was not what I already knew most about, but it was what I felt I most needed to understand because it was what I knew least about. Researching my book, Marxism and the Philosophy of Science, was an absorbing adventure. I felt like a detective undercovering an intricate series of intersecting stories. I tried to write a Marxist history of Marxism and science, despite the enormous and opposite pressures on me as I strove to do so. Pressures from east and west, from left and right, from old and new left, from commitment and career. Sometimes, to my surprise, I felt more of an affinity with the previous generation of the left than my own. I could not understand why my contemporaries, especially among British Marxists, turned their backs on the, early generation, the earlier generation of British Marxists and went flocking to Althusser or Foucault. New Left Review veered between obliviousness and hostility to the previous generation of British Marxists. Radical Science Journal did engage with the earlier generation, however critically. Gary Worski's book, The Visible College, was perhaps the most substantial work mediating between these two generations on questions of science. Meanwhile, Marxism today went from being a journal where science was integral to its agenda and various positions uh, and generations could argue their case to one another, that, and it then began to close down on science and to close down on those who held certain positions, such as my position. Living as if in some parallel universe much of the time, parts of academe proceeded as if the only story in philosophy of science was the one proceeding from the Vienna Circle through Popper, Lakatos, Kuhn, etc. Philosophy of science in philosophy departments rarely took a sideward glance at this other tradition. The work of Engels, Bukharin, Hessen, Bernal, Haldane, Langevin, Hertz, and many others was never mentioned. I found adjusting to the philosophy department of Trinity College Dublin, where I was, was at the time, strange every time I returned to it from Moscow or Berlin or Dubrovnik or even London. <coughs> Meanwhile, <coughs> Soviet delegation, I need some water here, <coughs> <clears throat> Meanwhile, Soviet delegations were no longer a surprise at international conferences. They were integrated into the organizing structures and gave papers in many sessions. However, how much of a meeting of minds occurred was another matter. The World Congress of Philosophy was held in Dusseldorf in 1978. I spent much of that year in Eastern Europe, mostly in Moscow, researching my book. The philosophers were constantly um, asking uh, about the World Congress of, of Philosophy. They were, they, were, they were talking about it all the time. It came into almost every conversation. Uh, in fact, um, they were preparing for it as if it were Warsaw Pact maneuvers, um, which I found very strange. They kept asking me what Irish and British philosophers were planning for the conference. And I said, they. They weren't really planning anything in the sense that, that they met. They, they were either coming or not coming uh, as individuals, uh, and they were thinking only about their own papers and, and travel arrangements. 
And I, I found this, this clash of cultures uh, kind of fascinating because I was moving back and forth uh, between both of these intellectual cultures. At the Congress itself, which was the first ever World Congress of Philosophy that I attended myself, philosophers from the socialist countries and philosophers from the rest of the world mostly read papers past each other, indeed, as most academics at most conferences do. There were, however, uh, several skirmishes and a real Cold War atmosphere at the Congress. I felt myself to be in a similar situation to the British Marxists at that 1931 Congress. I moved between both sides uh, in a way that very few did at that time. I found this actually to be quite stimulating, uh, and I entered into all the polemical possibilities that the situation offered to me. It was similar at other conferences in those years. For example, the International Congress of Logic, Methodology, and Philosophy of Science in Hanover in 1979, and the International History of Science Congress in Bucharest in 1981. At the latter, I was often in the company of British historians of science, mostly of the kind that were not convinced by the Soviet delegation at the 1931 Congress. I felt that my arguments that Marxism plus science did not necessarily equal Lysenko constantly been undermined by the locus and the events of the Congress itself. Elena Ceausescu was presented to a plenary session as a great scientist, and many sessions featured Romanians argue, arguing that Romanians were responsible for many discoveries in the history of science and technology that were attributed to others, including Einstein. There were others who were negotiating these tensions. Uh, I found it very interesting to meet uh, Joseph Needham, uh, who was there, who was also at the 1931 History of Science Congress, and was still mediating between East and West in his own way um, 50 years later. So there were other enclaves uh, where there was sustained cross-fertilization, such as the Boston Colloquium and the Philosophy of Science. There was the Inter-University Center in Dubrovnik, which was a pioneering and important base for interaction between East and West, between Marxists and non-Marxists. I have happy memories of stimulating encounters at both the Philosophy of Science Congress that was held every year as well as the Praxis Conference that was held every year. In the late 1980s, uh, in Eastern Europe, there was much happening. Everything opened up, only to close down again. In 1990, it seemed as if the world turned upside down. The USSR, the GDR, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia disappeared from the map of the world. I often wondered, when I was in these countries before that, how many of the intellectuals that I met in Eastern Europe would be Marxists if there was regime change? So, I found out. I had several confrontations in the 1990s with those who made their careers professing Marxism and then made their careers by denouncing Marxism. <laughs> Academic life all over the world is full of such people. They do what is necessary to advance themselves, and they are rewarded then and now. But they will never produce anything of real value. So I did find out who were the true believers, and there were some. In 1996, I was sent by my university to a university in Slovakia as part of the European Union's Tempus program, which sent Western academics into Eastern University in, in, to Eastern universities to show them how proper universities were run. I was asked to give a guest lecture at a topic of my choice. I said Marxism. <laughs> they were surprised, uh, shocked even, uh, and then disconcerted. I was a bit of a Trojan horse. Nevertheless, the norm was when, you know, the visiting academic said what topic that they organized it. So they organized it. The room was absolutely packed 
And not because I was famous there. It wasn't because of that at all. It was because Marxism had the free song of forbidden fruit again. So I addressed this. I said, really, like the situation in, these, in some of these universities, such as that university, it was the University of Preshov, I said, it's, it, the situation is ridiculous. Marxism was the philosophy for decades. Then it disappeared from the curriculum as if it had never happened. It was actually wiped out of, of the history of philosophy as if it had never existed. Uh, so it was orthodoxy one day and either absence or apostasy the next, uh, which obviously is, is not healthy. Because whatever you, you thought about it, Marxism is a major intellectual tradition in the history of the world. It is, no matter whether you're for or against it, it is a major intellectual tradition in the whole history of the world. And I've argued that things would never be healthy uh, at these universities unless it found its place vis-a-vis -vis all other contenders. It was not, wasn't healthy for it to be the orthodoxy either. Um, but for Marxism, to, to, it's not the right thing for a university to be committed to a, a particular worldview when there are others in contention. And the healthiest thing for Marxism is to have to argue its way uh, on its merits vis-a-vis -vis other intellectual traditions, which hasn't so far happened in, in most of Eastern Europe, or Western Europe for that matter. Um, but it was interesting <clears throat> Uh, actually, for so many people came to this, you know the, these, the, these rooms, there was a room about this room, and you know how they have these separators, but they had to actually remove the separator, and there's an overflow crowd and everything. It was, and and it, 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 it really had to do with how the position of Marxism had changed just in those six years. Um, but after it, it was interesting that people uh, came, I was there for a, a week, and people came whispering to me um, in the following days. Uh, saying that they agreed uh, with what I said, but they didn't want to be seen or heard doing it. Um, so obviously that's an unhealthy position in the university. In 2007, uh, I returned to this philosophy of science conference uh, in Dubrovnik again, where there had been such a healthy interaction between East and West and Marxism and uh, other points of view. I found Marxism, uh, except for my presence at it, um, nearly absent. I found a preoccupation with Platonism and thought experiments, uh, which is very odd in philosophy of science, uh, and, this, and a kind of odd philosophy of science that had almost nothing to do with actual science. Um, I spoke to a number of Eastern European uh, intellectuals who were there uh, from different countries, including the Soviet Union, uh, who had who, a different, who were of different generations and, and of different points of view. Uh, what I found most striking um, was the surprise of the younger intellectuals uh, in Eastern Europe uh, to hear somebody make a case for Marxism in this area. And there was a kind of curiosity and, and openness uh, about it, uh, which was interesting. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's just deadly for a, for a philosophy uh, to be forced on people. Even, you know, back in, in the 70s when I was doing my research uh, in the Soviet Union, um, I used to wander around, Mes uh, around Moscow and I had contacts, a, a lot of my contacts obviously were through my research, um, through um, the inter International Department of the Communist Party, Moscow University, the Academy of Sciences and all that. But I had some contacts who had nothing to do with all of this. And uh, I was just walking the streets of Moscow with this, this young woman one day, and she was asking me about my research, and I was explaining it to her. And she just found it amazing that somebody would voluntarily be a Marxist <laughs> to study Marxism when they didn't have to. Um, and, you know, this, this was very telling uh, about, you know, the position of Marxism in, in the Soviet Union. So I've gone back to Eastern Europe. Um, quite a lot uh, in the years uh, since 1990. Um, I, I go uh, especially often to Berlin, uh, visiting the vanquished, uh, the, Marx, the Marxist intelligentsia of the ex-GDR, uh, especially those that, that I knew uh, through philosophy of science, those who were um, seriously committed 
uh, to the philosophical interpretation of science, uh, who uh, had occupied the apex of academe during the period of the GDR, and now led, led you know, completely marginalized lives. A lot of them had been forced into retirement, uh, moved from the center of Berlin into areas that were further and further out from the center of Berlin, but still were real true believers continuing this work, although there was no career advantage in it anymore whatsoever. So I was most impressed uh, by those people uh, with the strength of their convictions and the seriousness with which they continued the work under such unfavorable circumstances. So these have been hard times for Marxism in philosophy of science as in all else. So what remains? Um, I would argue that more remains than is at first apparent. Lauren Graham of MIT, who has spent his whole professional life studying Soviet and post-Soviet science and philosophy of science, has said this about dialectical materialism. This philosophy of... Oh, by the way, uh, you know, Lauren Graham is not himself a Marxist. He said, this philosophy of science is actually quite a sensible one and corresponds to the implicit views of many working scientists all over the world. Uh, Graham has gone on to show that this philosophy has had a lasting impact on Russian scientists even after the demise of the Soviet Union. The story of Marxism in relation to these experiments in socialism is not so played out as some might think. As a Marxist, as an activist one, I for many years had difficulty in finding secure employment, but eventually I became a university professor. I taught science studies from BA to PhD level, but also ranged more widely in history of ideas and even media studies. It may seem to be darting around between all these areas, but Marxism held it together on the level of worldview. For me, Marxism still makes more sense of science and everything else than anything else that I see around me. So what do I see around me when I look around now? Uh, and where do I see Marxism and science in all this? I see a flourishing of science and science studies in the sense that there's a lot of it going on. There's much funding, many metrics, all sorts of empirical studies. Much of it is interesting and valuable, although a lot of it is bland, trivial, and useless. Many studies are short and shallow and driven by market demand and fast-track careerism. Philosophy is not holding its ground in this scenario at all. The intensification of commercialization of science as part of the general commodification of knowledge is the biggest thing happening in our universities globally. A new orthodoxy has taken command, not so much by winning arguments, definitely not by winning arguments, but by wielding systemic power on a global scale. Theory is not thriving in this arena. Universities are being harnessed to operate by market norms and survival of the fittest and commercial competition is outstripping all other forms of validation, including truth criteria, theoretical depth and breadth, moral responsibility, or political engagement. There are powerful pressures disincentivizing, eroding, and marginalizing critical thinking creative thinking, systemic thinking, especially systemic thinking. Universities are contested terrain. Those who would defend theory, however, are in a weakened state. The atmosphere has changed drastically from what prevailed in the 1960s and 1970s. Then there were large-scale contending paradigms in every area facing off against each other with great energy and passion. It's gone quiet now. It's eerie and disconcerting because 
it's not as if anything has been settled. It's that people have learned to live with problems unresolved or even unacknowledged, or to settle for resolution at a less than fundamental level. The confrontations of worldviews have given way to low-level eclecticism. There is a narrowing of perspective and retreat from engagement, whether through myopia, ignorance, shallowness, conformity, fear, or careerism. Much of what I read or review is so half-baked. Conceptualization is weak and confused. Contextualization is thin and random. Marxism has nurtured in me a demand for conceptualization that is strong and lucid, for contextualization that is thick and systemic. Many social studies of science, including some associated with a strong program, are actually too weak in conceptualization and contextualization. The science wars of the 1990s did set big ideas in play, but in a very odd kind of a way. I found myself on both sides, yet wholly on neither, and I'm not a fence sitter either. I agreed with those who wanted to defend the cognitive capacity of science against epistemological anti-realism, irrationalism, mysticism, conventionalism, and especially against anything goes postmodernism. I also agreed with those who insisted on a strong socio-historical account of science against a reassertion of scientism. A better grounding in the Marxist tradition has brought to be, uh, a better grounding in what the Marxist tradition has brought to bear on these issues would have done a lot to illuminate this terrain if people had paid more attention to it. I do not believe that the debunking of science in terms of its cognitive capacity is an appropriate activity for the left. It is neither epistemologically sound nor politically progressive. The left should take its stand with science, a critically reconstructed, socially responsible science, but with the possibilities of science. At a University of Paris conference on Marxist historiography of science, in which I participated, one participant put the range of positions on this quite simply and starkly. He said, there are positions that are pro-science and pro-capitalist. Other positions, which are anti-capitalist and anti-science, our position is pro-science and anti-capitalist. Stark simplicity. Science studies has become too small, too introverted. Its exponents esoterically cite themselves and each other and fail to look wider. I picked up a science studies reader recently, and I couldn't imagine why anybody could possibly want to read it. It seemed obsessed with many debates of micro tendencies. Latour and Kalan versus Yearly and Collins, etc., etc. I'm really not sure who cares, because honestly, I don't. There was only weak evidence of relevant intellectual history and very thin social context. There were no references to Bernal, Haldane, Caldwell, Bukharin, Hessen, Levins, Lewinton, Wartowski, Hertz, and only trivial ones to Marx and Engels. As to philosophy, although it is central to the human condition, many professional philosophers have reduced it to technicist esoterica. They have alienated many who have come to it seeking meaning and put any defense of its declining status on very dubious grounds, all the while strutting about oblivious to the house burning down, preening themselves on their ratings in their philosophical gourmet guide on American postgraduate programs in philosophy. So I would argue uh, that Marxism is still an alternative. It is still superior to anything else on the scene. Marxism has been a major position in the history of philosophy. 
It has been a formative force in science studies and other disciplines, and it is a continuing influence. It's there in ways that are not always acknowledged. It's sometimes the philosophy that dare not speak its name. Since the rise of the New Right in the West and the collapse of socialist experiments in the East, Marxism has become heresy again. Moreover, many of its premises have come to be so accepted that it seems no longer necessary or opportune to say from where they've come. And it's not only a matter of dare not or need not, but it's often a matter of know not. Many younger academics have only a weak knowledge of the history of their own discipline, or the history of much else for that matter. They do not know where many of their own premises have come, and indeed that many of them have in fact come from Marxism. So Marxism lives on, um, but in quite circuitous and complex ways. Sometimes in strong, brilliant, defiant ways, sometimes in subtle yet influential ways, and sometimes too in weak, confused, and debased ways. It's often Marxism light as an element of intellectual history light to be rated for random insights for theory light. Sociology of knowledge needs to be brought to bear upon trends even in sociology of knowledge, including sociology of knowledge light. So where have all the Marxists gone? Uh, some of us are, are still here, um, <laughs> struggling on, sadder but wiser, also a lot older. Um, others are still there, but quieter. It doesn't come screaming um, off their CVs or their web profiles necessarily, as it probably does on mine. But it informs their work, nevertheless, in many ways. There are others who are quasi-Marxists or post-Marxists. They become discouraged by defeat or decentered by postmodernism. It was one thing when the wind was at their backs, but they've been swept off their feet by cross winds that they could not withstand. Then there are the ex Marxists. Some of them go witch hunting and draw up lists. I'm thinking of this David Horowitz uh, book about the 101 most dangerous professors in America. There is modest evidence of a revival of interest in Marxism and science in recent years. There was a seminar at Princeton uh, on geopolitics, Marxism, and 75 years of science studies. Another um, at the uh, Science Museum in London, both of these marking the 75th anniversary of the 1931 History of Science Congress. Now, I think this is interesting because there are not a lot of commemorative um, uh, events surrounding conferences. Uh, the, the 1931 Congress was the second international Congress uh, of the history of science, but there were no commemorative, commemorative events celebrating the first or the third or the, the tenth. Uh, so why the second? Um, it obviously testifies to the impact of Marxism on the discipline. Uh, there was also an event uh, to assess and honor J.D. Bernal, organized by the Institute of Physics in Ireland in Limerick, which took me by surprise. And actually, since then, uh, there have been a number of Bernal chairs uh, founded at the University of Limerick. Now, uh, some of the people involved kind of ignore the fact that he was a Marxist, even a communist, but he was a, a world, he was considered a world, world class scientist um, uh, who, uh, some, somebody who came from that area, he's, he was Irish, uh, somebody who came from that area near Limerick and made it big on the international stage and they, they just kind of don't talk about Marxism. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I find it quite interesting that, that uh, Bernal has been uh, revived in, at, at the University of Limerick. Uh, the University of Limerick didn't exist in this time, but it does now. So um, 
recent events and publications uh, take different points of view um, on, on this tradition, even on Bernal. Um, I, I found it interesting to, to see a lot of new research and interest in Bernal and, and new debate about Bernal. Uh, but all the old caricatures are still in play. Um, at this, uh, this particular conference uh, that was organized by the Institute of Physics in Limerick, uh, I found myself at odds with uh, Andrew Brown, who was the author of a new uh, biography of Bernal. Uh, and his biography, uh, which and it, it, it was a, a very prominent biography, it was you know reviewed not only in a lot of academic journals but you know in the, the major British newspapers, Times of London, and all this. Um, so uh, I, I I found it interesting um, in in the biography and the reviews of it. I detected this uh, emerging consensus about Bernal that I felt uh, I had to contest. Uh, because it was admiring uh, of his science and his war effort, uh, it was bemused by his sex life, which was, you know, um, kind of unusual and, pro let's, say, let's say, prolific. Um, and, uh, but uh, condescending uh, about his philosophy and his politics. Uh, some commentators seem to believe uh, that the mere mention uh, of dialectical materialism makes the case that it's self-evidently ridiculous. Uh, but I ask, uh, what is a more appropriate philosophy for a scientist or anyone else? Positivism? Neocontinism? Postmodernism? Theism? What? As for politics, what sheds more light on the world we inhabit? Neoliberalism? <coughs> Neoconservatism? What? What sheds more light on, on the terrain of our lives, even now? So where are we now? Um, it's a paradox. Never has there been such a totalizing, systematizing force as contemporary global capitalism. And yet, never has there been such inhibition of synthesizing systemic thinking. The centralizing market decenters the psyche. It organizes consumption, but disorganizes community. It can meet the decadent demands of some for luxury homes, SUVs, and haute couture, but while it does not meet, meet the most basic needs of others who live in shacks made of rubbish, without electricity or running water. It cannot meet the need for meaning or community for anyone. But there is nevertheless a seeking of truth and a striving for justice that the system can neither satisfy nor suppress. In this I place my hope for a revival in the kind of totalizing thinking and collective acting that Marxism has nurtured for decades. So in conclusion, the history of Marxism and the interpretation of science is tied inevitably to the history of everything else. It has so far been a riveting drama full of revelation, catharsis, tragedy, and farce. And it's not over. Perhaps what you're doing here at UNO is the beginning of the next act.